And if you have if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to relay your questions um, in the chat and I will relay it to the presenters. We also want to let you know before we begin that the views, policies, and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect those of SAMHSA or Health and Human Services. And I'd like to take the time to quickly introduce our two presenters here with us um, who will be sharing some great information with us about, um, you know, just the title session there, just, you know, impacts of equitable consultation. Um, but first, let me go ahead and introduce them. Um, so Alicia Gandhi is an infant and early child therapist and mental health consultant with Austin Guidance Center in Austin, Texas. As a therapist, um, she works with children zero to 17 years of age with trauma, anxiety, internal, external stressors, family conflict, mental health struggles of all types. Um, Alicia has worked um, for over a decade, has over a decade of experience providing mental health care and consultation in Texas. Um, one of the things that has led her to focus on the issues of cultural humility and understanding of biases in her role as a therapist and uh, mental health consultation um, in working with the Austin Guidance Center. Um, so with with that, the part of, you know, leading to that work, um, She's done a lot of work in anti-racism and um, understanding of prejudices in the workplace, as well as in her own personal life. So that's Alicia. And then Tamika Thompson, um, she's also an infant and early childhood uh, therapist and program supervisor with the same program, Austin Child Guidance Center. Um, and you know they specialize in trauma-informed care. And as a therapist, um, Tamika, also works with children uh, zero to 17 years of age uh, who are dealing with you know, very similar things that I just labeled and named that Alicia also works with. And as a therapist and a mother, she understands and sympathizes with the struggles of discussing racism and discrimination with children. Um, and then Tamika has a, a history of building everlasting bonds between um, their, sorry, between children and parents um, before working with um, the, the Austin Guidance Center, Tamika spent over 15 years in the mental field as a caseworker. Um, and also, uh, you know, this experience of working with um, lots of populations has led her to gain ex expertise in crisis intervention and training, dual diagnosis treatment, intervention work uh, with police departments, and working with parents and children recently di diagnosed with mental illness. Um, she's also found her cornerstone in building relationships in the community that bring awareness to people from all walks of life. So with both of them here with us, we we can go ahead and get started into our session. And we'll hand it off to both of you as our wonderful presenters today. Thank you so much for having us. We're excited to present to you guys today. And we're also excited to um, hear some feedback from the audience. Um, of the the different styles, um, the different um, abilities that y'all have in the community. Um, again, my name is Tamika Thompson. I'm a licensed professional counselor. I'm the supervisor for our IEC Infinite Early Childhood Program. And I'm excited to also introduce my coworker, Alicia Gandhi. She is a licensed um, social work, licensed clinical social worker, and I'll have her introduce herself and we'll get started. Yeah, thank you for having us, everybody. Uh, my name is Alicia Gandhi. Um, Tamika is my supervisor, and um, I have been with Austin Child Guidance Center for a couple of years, um, but I actually interned here 10 years ago when I was a student um, at UT Austin, and I'm excited to be here and to be talking about this topic with you all. So the why of our work. Uh, so we wanted to kind of start off um, by talking about some statistics. So there were uh, some studies done by Head Start nationally. Um, and what they had found was that preschoolers were expelled three times the rate of kids kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, and these studies were conducted with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and 
it was in an effort to figure out sort of what was going on at preschools and childcare centers around the country, why there was such a high rate of suspension and expulsion in particular for black children and children of color. Uh, so we were looking through this um, and what we had found, preschool aged boys were four times as likely to be expelled as girls um, and that African-American children were expelled at almost twice the rate as Latino and white children and more than five times the rate of Asian American children. Uh, there are many reasons for this and we're gonna talk through it in this presentation today of sort of like what we have seen in Texas, uh, what some of the national statistics have seen as well, um, and maybe some of the reasons that might be going on behind this, as well as how we try to combat this in the centers that we uh, that we work at and do consultation with. Um, some of the work that we have found that, that is helpful is really focused on teachers overwhelm. So we're going to talk about that a lot today and how sometimes that overwhelm can cause teachers to treat children differently. Um, and so we'll kind of go through some of the reasons behind that. Uh, one other statistic that, we, that really stood out to us was that over 50% of children aged two to five have experienced their first trauma. Um, and oftentimes that first trauma can be racially based. We found in our research, um, there is a high, high rate of racially based trauma in this country. So we'll talk more about, about that as well and the impact that that can have on students. So continuing the why of our work, um, just us doing the research and us actually being in the centers, we come across um, some teachers that are feeling overwhelmed. Um, we're looking at some of the, the kiddos that have been in the classroom that have hopped over to different centers from centers to centers. And you're thinking like at one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-olds, how could these kids be kicked out of um, schools? How could they be suspended? How, um, and that is the passion that we bring over here is to look at that system. Um, so teachers have lost more than 25% of their child care. And this is um, in the, the Texas area since 2020. Um, well, it's important for us to invest in our children to see, you know, what is the ratio looking like? Um, how many kiddos are in the classroom versus how many teachers are in the classroom? Are there, there are certain kiddos that are giving, getting more um, attention than the others? What kind of attention does that look like? Um, our, our focus too is demolishing a lack of awareness and, and just turning a, a blind eye to racial disparities. The biggest thing that we were hearing in the centers is, you know, I, um, I, I don't participate in that, but also participating in, a, in that is not saying anything. That's part of participating. So bringing awareness to someone um, in order for them not to feel shame. Um, because there's sometimes there is a lack of knowledge and there's sometimes there are people that are just blatantly discriminating against others. So that is important for what we do um, within our centers, um, trauma-informed practices. Um, and what that means is, is looking at a kiddo, where they come from, um, what unique qualities they have, what unique um, opportunities that they have. So helping those um, the teachers understand and not just looking at, you know, the kid and saying, oh, you know, I'm just treating everybody the same. No, you're not necessarily treating them the same. What are you looking at? What what are they needing? What are their families needing? Um, and ultimately to help that kid strive within the school. And so we know we're talking to a lot of professionals uh, here in this room, a lot of mental health uh, consultants and other people that are in this early childhood education field. And so you all have a lot of knowledge already um, about all of this, but it, in the research that we've done, we've found that there has been uh, obviously a really a disproportionate level of children of color, Black children in particular, being targeted in this way in these centers, which is what uh, drives a lot of the work that we do. Um, so the increased need for social emotional learning in these centers, um, there was a study that was done at the School Mental Health Journal um, just last year that basically found that teacher stress, the higher the teacher stress predicted a higher level 
of expulsion for children of color, the risk of that, and for Black children. Um, like we had mentioned before, you know, there's a lot of things that can play into teacher stress. Implicit bias is one thing that kind of pops up there that we'll get more into and that Tamika had mentioned that we do address directly with staff and directors at the centers when we do see, you know, maybe there is a white teacher who has some implicit bias or some prejudice against other teachers of color or children of color. Uh, we try to address it head on and we'll talk more about that. Um, but this implicit bias it increases the chance of black children and children of color to get in trouble or to be expelled uh, for the same behaviors that white children might be exhibiting and not getting into trouble for. Um, so 2021, the Department of Education reported that as early as preschool, 17,000 kids are suspended or expelled across the country every year. And about 50% of these are black boys, despite black boys are only about 20% of preschoolers enrolled in the country. So obviously there's something going on here where, and not just white teachers, but where teachers are targeting these children for expulsion or seeing their behaviors in a way that other children are not treated in the same way. Um, and so we try to bring awareness and, and light and shine a light on that, um, even if it means having some really tough conversations at the centers that we're at. Yeah, and part of us doing that too is we see a lot of kiddos, like I said earlier, that are bounced from one childcare facility to the other. So taking the opportunity to talk to the teachers about it not being already judgmental, like, oh, this child has been in multiple centers, you know, it, this child is bad, having those judgmental attitudes and perspectives. Um, so we take those opportunities to really look at the core of what is going on um, with those kiddos. Mm -hmm. So as Alicia was talking about, some signs of implicit bias um, that we're seeing um, is children from different backgrounds or social groups, um, different intellectual abilities being treated differently. Um, and a lot of what we're finding in there is just, they were treated differently just by how they look. You know, um, some of the kiddos being looked at as being older um, than their white counterparts or the Asian uh, community. Um, and, and it's not just African-American boys have a high rate of being expelled and suspended. Also closely behind that is Hispanic boys mm -hmm. um, being expelled um, and Hispanic children, girls um, being ex expelled at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. um, not wanting to talk to certain families because this family has been in, in different places, though, they, they don't want to hear what I have to say. Mm -hmm. So taking those opportunities and talking to them about what it what are you looking at to say this family does not want to speak with you or talk with you? Um, what signs are you giving off? Are you being approachable where the family feels comfortable? Um, looking at those um, options where a, a family, they might be tired, exhausted, so they feel like they need to come in and get out of there so they don't have to hear that. Um, certain children being more frustrating than others. We were hearing a lot of that too, like, he's always doing something. He's always in trouble or she's always doing something. She's always um, getting in trouble. Things. She doesn't listen. Um, so the language was even different mm -hmm. than speaking with the kids and, and having those conversations about you know, when we're going in there observing is listening out, listing out those, that communication with that child. Um, difference in label praise, um, telling one kid, oh, you did a good job. Uh, you didn't act up today. Um, he only got in trouble just a, a couple of times today. And the difference between that label praise of a, a white child, you, you did so good. I'm so proud of you. Always listen. You always pay attention. You know, just the difference in that, the praising looks, um, the side eyes um, with one of the kids like, you know, are they going to do something today? So seeing that uh, that bias of that, the difference in the the punishment and the consequences of the kids mm -hmm. is, I think one of the things that is more frustrating to me, a child was doing similar behaviors mm -hmm. that a white child was doing, but that little black boy was getting in trouble or his parents were being called mm -hmm. or they were threatened to call the parents. If you don't do this, I'm going to call your parents. Mm -hmm. Um, stereotyping in the halo um, and horns effect, putting one child on a pedestal versus the other one. Those are the kind of things that some of the teachers 
were saying they weren't noticing in the classroom mm -hmm. that we had to start pointing out and figuring out ways to overcome some of these barriers and obstacles that these little ones were facing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what is social emotional learning? Social emotional learning is the core and foundation of acquiring an effective, applying the skills and knowledge to understand and manage emotions. The methodology that helps students better understand the depths of their emotions and others and also recognize other people's emotions. And what I quickly wanna do is um, if you guys feel comfortable, I us talking about what kind of the things that we're seeing um, within the classroom, not just with the teachers, mm -hmm. but with directors and supporting staff. I would love to open it up to anybody that feels comfortable with what they're seeing and maybe give us a brief example of how you're able to approach that situation. And we have the chat open, so feel free to throw some examples in the chat. Um, we're just, we're curious what, for those of you who go into centers or work with those who go into centers um, or have in the past, we're curious, you know, what you have seen related to what we've already talked about and maybe uh, where you have seen social emotional learning work or where you've seen that it needs, we need some work. All right. So I see Linda here. Um, yeah, Linda, you want to go ahead and share? Um, what I've seen in the past and and going as we go forward, that um, there is a lot of biases. And when you pointed out <clears throat> what I have have has has affected me, the unfortunate <clears throat> is when I brought it to the attention of the director because they were in a very elite type setting and they had a lot of people there that had wealth. Um, they didn't want to hear it. And mm -hmm. ask ask if I would be removed from their center wow. as their coach. Um, and what was sad is that if I didn't document everything that was being done, I had them to do a, a behavior log. I had them to write it, put it in their own handwriting, what steps they were taking. And I asked, what was the difference between a a child that was mixed in race versus a Caucasian who clearly had some issues where the mixed race child was just really um, inquisitive and loved showing what he's learned. So there was clearly a difference. And I said, what is the difference? But then what even compounded it is that the agency that I worked for at that time and that um, director is no longer there was setting it up so that they could fire me Be because I had it so well documented, they had no cause. And it just amazed me how people will go to that length to get rid of me when I'm a man, and I kept saying, I'm a mandated reporter. I mm -hmm. have to report what I see. And I have to report when I'm hearing and getting a language that makes me feel that that child's life can be threatened. Um, and so I see it then, I see it more now than ever, um, but I'm hesitant as to how far I will go. So thank you. So yeah, that's yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you, Linda. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful example of exactly what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And thank you, yeah, for sharing that because that is some of the things that we face is you're a mandate reporter. But think about the obstacles that you have to go through. Think about that kid, you know, they're facing, they're like, okay, is it always going to be like this? Am I always going to be treated differently? They can't advocate for themselves the way that we can advocate for ourselves. So we have to go through barriers. They have to go through barriers at two years old, mm -hmm. you know, just because of how they look. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, we're going to continue to talk, but this is part of, you know, what we're doing also too, Linda, like you're saying, protect ourselves mm -hmm. because we have to go in there and fight for this kid, this family, but we're also wanting to protect ourselves as mental health professionals. So yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that. And it is, um, it's tricky. It's tricky because 
you know, like I am a white woman. And so me going into these centers, I have definitely heard some things uh, <clears throat> that maybe the teachers felt like because I was a white woman, that I would be comfortable with, you know, them saying something like this to me, something that is subtly racist or overtly racist about other staff members. Um, and so I do feel protected as a white person in that way where I can go to the director and have a conversation and say, this is what I've heard and seen. And, you know, let's talk about even going to HR and that kind of thing. But like Tamika has shared with me, if we have an intern that comes to work with us and comes to the centers with us and that intern is a person of color, you know, then they might not feel safe at these centers in the way that I would feel safe at these centers. So we're always, we're always looking at our identities as well, us as staff too. And, uh, and I, documenting things is a really effective way to kind of cover your butt too. Mm -hmm. Um, and I see some other stuff in the chat. So let's see, excluding kids from certain activities due to their behaviors. Yep, definitely. Um, which we know just kind of perpetuates the problem. If a kid is excluded from a from an activity, then their behavior is not going to get much better. Um, someone, uh, K Katrina said, at a pre-K through fifth grade, you've seen that children need extra supports behaviorally, socially. Um, and mainly interacting with an interventionalist, but not having like a psychologist or a counselor on staff so that the stress of the teachers is compounded every day. And their comments show that frustration, um, which makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, excluding kids from typical behaviors, having this hard conversation with educators and programs, is it is hard and it takes building and finesse and bravery. It does, it's true. These conversations don't come on the first day working with these centers for sure. Um, well, thank you guys so much for this. And we're, get, we're still going to have time at the end for questions too, and we'll open it back up. Um, but I appreciate everybody um, participating. Linda's wondering what's our opinion of staff lack of education in the child care centers? Well, we we have thoughts on that, but we'll see if we have time to get there. Yeah, we definitely have thoughts on that one. Um, I think part of us getting there too is is working with the director, like Alicia say, you know, there are certain privileges um, other people have and there's certain privileges other people don't have is talking to the directors and saying, how is the best way for me to approach this situation with you and make, and not only are we holding ourselves accountable, mm -hmm. we're holding the director and the staff accountable. Mm -hmm. What's the best way, way to approach a situation with you if these things come up? Mm -hmm. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. In, like, yeah, right. pretty soon we're going to get into like our day to day at the center. So we'll get into that. Um, but briefly first, so we wanted to chat about the benefits of social emotional learning, which I'm sure a lot of you are already well aware, so we won't dwell on it long. Um, but basically, you know, all the things that you see on this slide, it's going to help kids to manage their emotions and their feelings. It helps them to work through stress. Um, it helps them just just them being able to identify their emotions and understand like, oh, when my little heart starts racing or when I start to feel hot, that means I'm mad or I'm starting to get anxious. We really try to help teachers help kids to figure that stuff out. Um, and then building and maintaining these positive relationships. We're helping kids to start that really early with their peers and with their teachers, which will help them in, you know, their everyday life and success in school and beyond. Um for the academic world, life goals, you know. We also have a really, Tamika and I have done a lot of work with trauma, obviously, and so that's always on the front of our mind as well. So any kiddo coming into the centers with trauma, which is probably half to 75% of the kids in the centers, I'd say most of them probably have some kind of trauma, um, then we help. it helps us to understand them better and then to be able to speak with the directors and the staff about, you know, just things like, trauma can cut a developmental age in half. So you might have a six-year-old or a five-year-old acting more like a two or a three-year-old. And so we we try to bring that approach as well so that teachers are, are fully aware of sort of what who's coming into their room and what they might be dealing with. And so what we do too is, is take an opportunity to educate the teachers on that. Because as we know, and I'm sure you guys know too, if there is a trauma component or something's happened, a behavior is going to increase. Mm -hmm. It's not because that kid is bad or they're not paying attention. They're trying to tell you something. So we take that opportunity to educate the teachers about what behaviors are you seeing and how we can best support that child. 
So, and this is a little bit about our day-to-day um, in the infant and early childhood. And I don't, I'm hoping that we would have time to get to at the end is I would love to see what you guys day-to-day looks like. But this is for IEC here in the Austin area. So, and it can look a little different from day-to-day, but this is our average day. Um, we're checking in with the director, um, seeing how the week is going. Is there any pain points? Is there things that we need to address? Is there concerns um, within the classroom? Things that we're seeing as mental health professionals. Um, so we do that overview of the director. And we're also providing the support for the directors. The directors are getting inundated with call in from the teacher and um, talking to a parent about a concern, um, being able to um, fully staff, uh, making sure everybody gets paid. So they're getting it from left and right. So we're making sure that we're providing the support for the director. Um, we do one-on-ones with teachers. Mm-hmm. And what that looks like is if we've done an observation of the classroom, um, we provide that feedback to the teachers. Um, and if teachers have com- concerns, like Alicia was talking about earlier, a lot of our teachers are experiencing stress. Um, so we provide some time for the teachers to talk about what they would like to see in their classroom. Is there anything that they feel like they need to improve on? So the observation too is our pre and our post assessments. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so it's the observation of assessments. Uh, also our observation is, is just observing the classroom. We kind of try to take a, a back step, you know, of, we're not in there, we're not writing stuff, we're not picking out all the bad things that you're doing. We're also highlighting the areas that your strengths are in and the areas that need improvement. And our assessments with it is our teapots and tapitos. Um, we do a pre-assessment and a post-assessment. There are times where we do a mid-assessment too. If we're seeing some really big areas um, that need to be addressed, we'll come in and do another assessment. Um, we set up goals and objectives for the classroom, which is really helpful is, again, how do you want to grow your classroom? How can you best not only support this family, the student, how do you su- uh, uh, support your mental health? How are you being present? for these kids. Mm-hmm. I mean, we create a plan um, of what that looks like. And, and when we're in, when we're creating that plan, it's implementation stage. And we're actually, it's, we're doing it one at a time because mm-hmm. we do notice that our teachers got a lot of other things going on. They got assessments that they need to do in their self. So we're seeing how we can incorporate that within the classroom that is not going to feel like it's it's a chore for them to do how they and how are they involving the kids so ultimately you know you're wanting to increase that SEL social emotional learning learning in the children you have to implement them it's not just about you going in and teaching it's actually you showing this child how to address different things in areas that come up in their lives and so Leslie had asked um With staffing issues, how have you worked through the problem of getting teachers out of the classrooms for one-on-one consultations, which is a really good question. I will say we don't. (laughs) We don't take them out of the classroom. We just do the consultations right in the room because you're exactly right. There's staffing issues all the time. I mean, sometimes I can get a director to come and sit in well, I can take a teacher out if I feel like it needs to be sort of a more in-depth conversation that we don't want kiddos to hear. Um, or honestly, I will go during nap time and just sit with the teachers and have some mini trainings or hard conversations sort of with hushed voices during nap times. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is definitely a challenge. Staffing is a challenge at all of our centers, yeah. and I'm sure it is across the country. Um, and I just want to quickly add on to that. Something that we're trying for this month um, is the um, prep time. Mm-hmm. So all teachers have a prep time um, where there's 30 or they're supposed to have a prep time. Uh, so it's about 30 minutes. Um, so what we're finding out, if we can take them for 15 minutes into a, a conference room and have our 15 minute check-ins. So what we've been doing, um, and this is new for us, is working with the director and setting up a schedule. So if they have a schedule prep time, this classroom has a 12 to 12.30, then I'm taking 12 to 12.15 to do um, consultation and stuff like that. So we're trying to see how that works. Um, Hopefully we'll have an opportunity to come back and um, see if it, it does work. But yes. this is something new for us. That yeah. we're trying. It, we, it is. It's true. Um, so, okay. So Tamika went through the day-to-day. So we just wanted to give some examples of some tips and 
tricks that we give the teachers. Um, so help to help build self-awareness, self-management, all of these different kinds of social awareness, all of that. So of course you guys, I'm sure do this. We have feelings charts everywhere. We want feel, we want them to be talking about feelings all day long. If we can get them to buy those little like worry dolls or the kind of dolls that have different emotion faces, then we love them to implement that as well. Um, at one of the centers I'm at, they do um, like a baby doll curriculum, which I think was a, a little bit of an expensive curriculum for them mm -hmm. to purchase because the dolls were expensive, mm -hmm. but it is very effective. We, I watch the kids every day take care of these little babies and they, they don't just physically take care of them, but they talk about their emotions and their, and uh, their physical needs and their social needs and everything for these little babies. And so, um, we try to encourage the teachers to do as much talk about emotions as possible, um, we also teach like them little mini yoga poses or deep breathing, teaching them like how to have kids exhale longer than their inhale. And Tamika and I don't uh, typically, we're not the ones doing the teaching but of this kids, of course, but we teach the teachers how to teach the kids these mm -hmm. skills. Um, sometimes though, Tamika and I do hop in. Like if we notice that there is a kiddo who's having a particularly you know, difficult behavior or something's going on and the teacher seems to be struggling. We don't, we don't count towards ratio or anything, but we will jump in to sort of model how to maybe address this behavior, how to speak with this kiddo in a different way, um, how to engage this kiddo in a way that they were not um, being engaged in other ways. Oh, someone just said baby doll circle time. Yes, exactly. That's what it's called. Baby doll circle time. Mm -hmm. Um, we help the kids, we help the teachers giving responsibility to the kids in the classroom, of course, having a line leader, superhero for the day, that kind of thing. Those are for the kiddos that are extra struggling. Um, basically like we're helping them to just build these skills. We're looking at the challenges that they see. We help them to figure out how to engage specific kids uh, with the behaviors that are really disruptive to the classroom. So most of the centers that we're at, they are they will not expel children at these centers. So they do end up having kids that have been expelled from several centers and have very difficult behaviors. And so we help them to figure out how to engage those kids. Sometimes it does mean extra assessments and then having a one-on-one -on -one aid, of course, come, but not always. Um, and we're also just helping the teachers to build empathy for these kids as well. Because like we said, if there is some kind of implicit bias or just general stress going on or like really high ratio or teachers are burnt out and overworked, then the empathy is going to be hard to build. So we help them to build that empathy. One thing I would like to say too is we both, Alicia and I, take an opportunity to educate the directors, mm -hmm. the teachers, the support staff on recognizing their own emotions. Mm -hmm. You will be very surprised when you go in there. A lot of, uh, not a lot, some of the teachers have experienced their own trauma. So they regulate in a way that feels comfortable for them mm -hmm. and they have a hard time managing their own emotions. So if you have a hard time managing your own emotions, it's hard for you to help someone else regulate. So if we see those opportunities, we take those opportunities to really work with them on how to manage stress, how to manage, you know, their emotions, how to relax, how to work through stressful situations. Mm -hmm. So I'm noticing the time. Um, and thinking that maybe we should move to the assessments okay. portion. Okay. Um, so this one, and I was talking just a little bit earlier too, this is our assessments um, and our outcomes. So we use the teapot and tapitos, and we always provide a survey at the end of the year. So what you can see right here, um, we, we provide it to the child care staff. And we have a hundred percent improvement of their understanding of children's social emotional development. So we do that that pre and then that post. And at, at pre time, you know, we have some people that I really don't know what SEL means. How do you manage that? So we're doing the education, and then we come back at the end of the year. So we had a hundred percent whenever we did this, which is amazing. You know, we're actually talking to the teachers about what does this look like for you? What is your understanding of SEO? Um, children who classroom demonstrated improvement with the teapots and torpedoes at the end of the year was running about 78%, mm -hmm. um, which is still amazing. I mean, that you have to think if you have 
what, 10 kiddos in a classroom, that's about seven kids that you've seen improvement with mm -hmm. that. So what does that look like over time? So the, 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 this assessment is really easy, it's simple to the point, and it's not, it's, it's also highlighting their strengths. That's what's really important to mm -hmm. us. We don't want to harp on all the things that you need to improve on, which sometimes we have to, but it's also highlighting the strengths of the teachers in the classroom. Exactly. Um, so yeah, our demographic information, um, this is sort of like an, a quick overview of the demographics that we see um, at the centers um, and that we're serving here at Austin Child Guidance Center. 55% um, females, 35% males um, being served, 46% Caucasian children, 19% African-American children, um, and 24% unknown prefer not to answer. Um, and 52% Hispanic and Latino children served in the past year, which is sort of a sort of a general overview of Austin, I would say. Not exact numbers, but that's sort of a general overview of like the demographics of Austin. Um, so getting into cultural perspective. So this is sort of where like the meat of a lot of our work happens. Um, and I, so we have just a few more minutes before we're getting, gonna get into question time. And I see some questions popping up in the chat, but we'll just go through this first. So as we check in with the director and individual staff, we do learn about things that have come up, right? We hear things, we hear them talk maybe about another teacher's race or identity in a way that could be demeaning, like maybe saying something like, oh, the kids don't want her around because like her hair, or, you know, even just making comments that the teacher might feel like they could say something like that. And it's okay. It's okay to say, but we hear it and we think like, oh, there's a little flag there of something going on where this teacher is discriminating against a staff member or discriminating against kiddos. Uh, so when we hear that, we don't let it go. <laughs> we in the moment, usually we'll go talk right to the director just to sort of get an overview of sort of what the director is thinking might be going on. Um, if there is an issue between two teachers, of course, we first encourage the teachers, if it is safe, to have a conversation between the two of them, if there seems to be something that could be worked out, but with the director's knowledge. Um, and we've had instances where teachers have not felt safe speaking with other teachers about discrimination or prejudice, which makes a lot of sense if they've been discriminated against. And so in those scenarios, we would encourage them to talk with the director. If it still felt like that wasn't something that was possible, then we're going to help them to review policies. We're not going to go to HR for them or have that conversation for them, but we're going to address what's going on and we're going to make sure that it gets addressed basically in the centers. Um, and so we then try to have some really in very intentional conversations in our training. So that's the next place that we take this. If we see that these issues are coming up, we schedule a training for like the next couple of weeks or a month. And we will really dig in in those trainings. So we, we talk about things that make people uncomfortable. So we'll talk about unconscious bias, unlearning prejudice. We'll talk about real life examples, you know, not calling people out in the room, mm -hmm. but calling out examples that we have seen um, maybe in our own lives or at other centers, you know, with de-identification, but we will give some pretty specific examples and make people a little bit uncomfortable, but that is, we're there to learn. So that's, you know, we have to get uncomfortable in order to learn. Um, we really try to dig into like the developmental considerations of kids understanding about identity. I think sometimes people feel like when kids are three or four, they're not thinking about race or identity, but we know based on studies that kids are aware of race as young as six months and they have preferences as young as three months. And so kids are thinking about this stuff and they're noticing this stuff. And if we are not talking about it, then the kids are talking about it amongst themselves. And so we need to be able to pick up on things, hear things, and then address them in the moment. And that's what we talk to the teachers about um, and the importance of having these conversations really early. Um, and when we get to the questions portion, we'd love to hear if you guys have other suggestions too about having these kind of hard identity conversations. Yeah, and so just quickly, some barriers that we face, some challenges that we faced um, within this uh, the centers is um, the teachers feeling overwhelmed. 
Um, lack of communication, that's probably a big one. Lack of communication amongst the staff. It's like I'm in here, I'm working, and I'm, I'm out. Um, and I say big one, but ratio concern is a really big one too. Um, so we've seen some that where they're at a ratio where there's things that are happening here that the teacher can't catch because they're dealing with another child mm -hmm. over there. Um, child care center is not ready for training and implementation of goals. Um, they're just focused on keeping the child safe, getting them in there and out there so they don't have the opportunities to um, receive the training that is possibly needed. Um, lack of support um, and also just being aware of behaviors. Um, we see some of the teachers um, and directors saying, you know, that kid is just being bad or that child needs, I'll hear that a lot, that child just needs a spanking, but they are not really understanding the depths of what the behavior and what that entails of the child and what the family is going through. So some of those are just some of the few barriers that we see um, within the classroom. Mm -hmm. So, and just to roll over into the things that we're doing um, that this is kind of new for us. Mm -hmm. So we haven't even started yet, but this is the things that we talked about for our implementation phase. So our plan, um, like for our next strategic year plan, basically, is to start to implement counseling support for the staff at these centers. We already refer them out, but we're, we're going to work on kind of doing some of that internally. Um, we were thinking also of putting together a support group for directors, because we noticed that they're sort of siloed in their own centers without getting a lot of the real type of support that they need, and they're very overworked. Um, wellness workshops for teachers, thinking of different ways to support them and let them know that they deserve to be taken care of as well. Um, and also having sort of direct connection to like a multidisciplinary team. So having like a nurse practitioner, diagnostician, psychologist, psychiatrist, therapist, that kind of thing that can kind of be there as a support um, for the staff at the centers that we work at. Mm -hmm. And so that was just a quick overview of the things that we're thinking about um, implementing. And we know this is mental health consultation. And so being part of counseling and support groups that blossoms into a whole different arena. Um, but we do notice that these are some of the things that keep some of the teachers stagnant, you mm -hmm. know, is, is having those workshops and having those support groups for them um, and looking how we implement it. They're already busy. They're already working 10, 12 hour days. So how do you implement that within a day? So these are the things that we're talking about um, as a team. Uh, we're talking about mm -hmm. actually with our partner centers, um, how can we best support you? Because we just don't want to be another IEC that just comes in, does observation and leave. We're actually trying to build a family for them to help them support each other while they're helping maintain and build on child's education and knowledge and build on their social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. So that is the end of our presentation. Um, we want, I know we only have like what, five, five minutes, minutes. <laughs> six minutes. Um, so we want to open up to see if you guys had any questions. And again, we appreciate the time that, um, and the energy that y'all have given to us for this presentation today. Yeah, and I'll look through the chat for, I, I know there's a couple questions in there, but please feel free to raise your hand um, and speak up for these last five minutes while we have some time. Leslie says, we have found a lack of mental health consultants that are available and equipped to meet the needs of littles. Have you found that in your area as well? Yes. <laughs> yes. It's something we struggle with here, um, but we try our best to do a lot of training to for those people that do want to get into this arena and help um, so they can have the support they need when they go into the centers. Yes. And we're hiring right now if anyone wants to move to Austin. <laughs> Let's see. Um, how might you address children trying to express their identity in an English only school? Okay, so kiddos who are speaking of a different language. Um, that's a really good question. I mean, if the resources are there, of course, we would recommend a staff member that's able to speak that child's language, um, even an aide or someone that's able to speak that child's language, because we certainly wouldn't want a child to ever feel um, like they can't express themselves at the center that we're at. If it was something like ASL, I would encourage the teacher to learn some sign language themselves um, to practice a bit or to, but I, I wouldn't feel comfortable with 
having a kiddo at a center that if they weren't able to speak the language, uh, no one could speak their language. So I would really want to, I would, I'd probably put all my efforts into making sure that we're able to find somebody that can help to translate for that kiddo. Yeah. Talk to the director and see if they can coordinate with, there's got to be, um, a, a board um, or directors that are over them because we do face that where there are teachers that can't speak that child's language mm -hmm. and then they say this child is acted up no this child is unable to understand you mm -hmm. so how do you get the resources in there to help them so like Alicia said connecting with um, a, a translator or figuring out you you guys and that's the thing you accepted this child Mm -hmm. into your center. Mm -hmm. So you have to be proactively finding ways to support the child, not just increasing your numbers. How are you going to best support this child? So that's mm -hmm. what I would do is talking to the director and see how you can get them. You know, they have the translation tablets and stuff. That's not the best, but it's a starting point, mm -hmm. you know, and then getting an aide that does speak the language, hiring somebody that can help, um, help support that child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a very tough situation. Um, Linda is asking, how do you engage with families? If so, how do you help them to get them to participate and understand SEL? Yeah, we didn't really get into this, but uh, another part of our job, as Tamika and I, is that we can work with individual families, um, anyone who wants to work with us at the center, and we can work with them on things like bedtime or getting ready for school, like whatever they're struggling with, um, doesn't have to be related to the centers. And so whatever families that will engage with us, we're there. I try to be there at pick up and drop off a couple times a month so that families see my face and they know who I am. Um, I introduce myself to families and then we offer free Zoom calls once a week, basically to help them with whatever is going on and encourage them to come to counseling. We encourage everybody to come to therapy pretty much. Um, and we do also to have, um, if you can coordinate with your centers, having once a month parent meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and that that is a good way to introduce yourself, give them the flyers um, so they can put a face with the name. But having those monthly parent consultation, even if you're there for five or 10 minutes, just introducing yourself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and then Janine had said, given the shortage of consultants, do you believe that consultants need to be licensed clinicians or can they have other training experience with children and be supervised by a clinician? I think I think so. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it needs to be somebody who is a licensed clinician. I think training and experience is enough with a supervisor. Mm -hmm. Definitely the training and experience. Um, it just providing that education and having that oversight. Even as licensed professionals, we need oversight of how we can best support one another mm -hmm. when they're in there. So, but yeah, I agree. You know, I think if there's a person that's willing to, to accept that challenge, mm -hmm. you know, and to get into this space, um, it needs to be somebody with a higher education. Mental health consultant can be very difficult and you can find a lot of burnout and compassion fatigue for that. Mm -hmm. So someone that has a higher degree in college, you know, and being able to um, receive the training. So I'm seeing other questions, but we are at 245. So I think we're at the end of our time. Is that right, Dawn? Yes. Yes, that is. Okay. Yeah. Oh. We, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much for all of the great uh, information. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you it. guys. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being here and participating and letting us share what we do. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Only if we had more time. <laughs>